Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Just a quick check, people at the back, can you hear me? I can't see you because the lights are so bright. Awesome, fantastic. Um, so it's great to be here in New York. If you're noticing a bit of an accent, I've come all the way from Australia. Um, so if I'm like, oh, g'day, mate, when I meet you, um, that's just how we talk in Australia. Um, so today, I want to talk about machine ethics and emerging technologies, um, or as I like to describe it, uh, why the future will be awesome and what you can do about it, because I feel that we need to do a few things right now to make that happen. So when I was growing up as a child, um, I really got into spy movies. I absolutely loved watching these spy movies. And I didn't love them because of the espionage or because of the characters or because of the interpersonal stuff going on. I loved them because of the technology. I loved the technology that you would see here. And for me, being an 11-year-old, the technology was absolutely believable. There would be things like uh, a cigarette that was also a rocket launcher, um, there was a car that could turn into a submarine, and the thing which I wanted more than anything else as an 11-year-old was this amazing device. It was a digital watch that was also a label maker. <laughs> that, that still remains, I think, the coolest thing I've ever seen. But there was one piece of technology that never quite sat all that well with me, and that was this car that knew uh, where it was and the streets around it. And I'm like, that wouldn't work. Like, how would a car know where it is? And, and how would it even know what the streets were around it? That's ridiculous. That's impossible. That would never happen in my lifetime. And of course, as, as we know, we now have all these like personal tracking devices, um, which know not only where we are, but also the streets around us, and you know where to get the best burgers on a Friday night. And what I discovered from that is that the future arrives very, very quickly the future arrives much more quickly than we thought, or than I thought. And for me, that's a problem. Because if I want to talk to people about new and emerging technologies, if I want to talk to people about in vitro meat, which is grown in a lab rather than a farm, or I want to talk to people about how 3D printed body parts might be a half billion dollar a year industry, or if I want to talk to people about what it's like for a machine to truly experience Burning Man, then people tell me, that's impossible, that's unrealistic, that would never happen in my lifetime. And I understand why this is the case. Very often, when I want to talk to people about new technologies, I want to talk to them about the ethics and the social consequences around it. And that's a very, very uncomfortable thing to do. Thinking about what the changes of new technologies might bring is something that makes people scared. It's something which makes them feel very, very uncomfortable. And it's natural for them to shy away from that and say, no, this would never happen. Because saying this would never happen is a, a safer thought to have. And the result of that is we tend to go from technologies being impossible to there's an app for that without there being a discussion in between. And, and that is something which I find quite concerning. So luckily, I've discovered that there's one weird trick that you can use to talk to people about new technologies. And that's to say, think about all the technological progress you've seen over the last 20 years, or the last 50 years, or their lifespan, and then imagine that continuing 1,000 years into the future, or imagine that continuing 10,000 years in the future. Imagine that far distant future where children 3D printing prosthetics can be a camp activity, or that far distant future where in vitro meat becomes consumer affordable or that far distant future where people have advanced virtual reality setups in their own lounge room. And people go, oh, 10,000 years in the future, we're doing a thought experiment. We're not talking about something which exists today. Sure, we might be talking about, like, is this better than that, or how should these things be arranged, but we're not really making a decision there. We're just talking about future ideas, and we're certainly not talking about anything that already exists. So I find that by phrasing things and how, uh, phrasing uh, technologies in terms of what they might be like 10,000 years in the future, you can remove a lot of that fear. And so that's what I'm going to do today. So I want you to think 10,000 years into the future where you might see autonomous vehicles, cars that can drive themselves. Now, I know this seems completely implausible. This is something that would never happen during our lifetimes. You would never see a car that could drive itself. But 10,000 years in the future, you might see something like this. And I want you to imagine a situation where you are a passenger in one of these vehicles. There are no longer any drivers. 
because there's no need to drive them, they drive themselves, but you're a passenger in one of these vehicles. And the car is like driving along this, this narrow road that's been cut out of a cliff. It's one lane, um, there's a sharp drop off on one end, there's a big cliff on the other end. You have all these cars, all these vehicles driving in a single file. And you know, you're happily you know, in the seat committing something to GitHub or playing Candy Crush or whatever it is you happen to, to be doing in this car. And quite unexpectedly, uh, while this car is driving along, a child chasing a ball runs out into the middle of the road and trips. So this is this terrible situation. Uh, the child was not carrying their tracking device, so the car didn't know that they were there. They were hiding around a corner. Suddenly, this car is heading towards a child at a speed at which it cannot prevent a fatal collision. And so this, of course, is a bad situation. But there is one thing that the car could do. Even though it can't stop in time, it does have one choice. The car could throw itself and its occupant off the cliff, which would kill the occupant, which is you, and destroy the car, but it would save the child's life. And the question which I ask you, of course, is should it do this? Now, some of you might say no, and some of you might say yes, and if you say no, then what happens if there are two children in front of the car? What if there are five children in front of the car? What if the car can turn into a submarine? All of those situations might change your answer. And if you're wondering how does it know there are five children in front of the car, it's 10,000 years in the future. The car knows. That's how advanced the technology is. But I would hope that after there is a sufficiently large number of children here, you say yes, the car should sacrifice itself and its occupant for the good of humanity. That is something which I would like to see the car doing. And of course, this brings us into this interesting realm of machine ethics. How do we program machines to act in an ethical way? And how do we even do that given that we have so many problems with human ethics? That it's so hard to actually come up with any sort of answer or solution to, to human ethical problems. The other question which I have with this, of course, is if there was a car that you knew would sacrifice itself for the good of humanity, would you ever buy one? And, and even if you might say yes, do you find it conceivable that there's somebody out there who might say, no, I'm not going to buy a car that would sacrifice me for the sake of humanity? And if that's the case, do we have a market for unethical cars? <laughs> and, and I think the answer here is that we absolutely do. Um, there was a, a luxury car manufacturer last year that briefly made a statement uh, about prioritizing the driver and occupants of their autonomous vehicles and then very quickly retracted that because of the backlash they received. But I think that we will absolutely see a market for unethical cars in the future. Another situation I like to explore with this, exactly the same scenario, exactly the same car that you're driving, there's a number of cars behind you, the same child runs out in front of the road, except the change here is that the car can stop safely. So it can stop safely, it won't injure the child, it won't injure the occupants, everyone else behind you can stop safely as well, but there's a lot of people behind you. And the question is, how many people need to be inconvenienced? How many people need to have their trip stopped or delayed before you can justify killing that child? <laughs> now, now, I hope that makes you feel uneasy. I hope that you go, oh my goodness, Paul, that is a horrifying question. <laughs> Why would you ever ask that? In what world is it ever acceptable to kill a child because it conveniences the people behind you? And the answer is it's already acceptable in this world. This is something which I'm asking because we have an answer for it. Right now, the answer is 8 million people. And the reason I can say that is for every 8 million trips which are conducted by road with human drivers, somebody dies in a traffic accident. And we consider that to be tolerable, we must consider that to be tolerable, because we allow humans to still drive cars. If that was something which is not acceptable to us, we wouldn't be allowing humans to drive cars, or we would be changing the laws or changing road conditions to change that. So this is something which we consider to be tolerable. One thing which we cannot program autonomous vehicles to do is to say that nobody should die. We can't tell them that nobody should ever die because if you try doing that, you end up with a vehicle that drives along at walking speed 
or slower than walking speed because maybe there's somebody hiding where it can't see in e-camouflage gear with an EMP device and they're going to jump out in front of the car unexpectedly. You can't tell them that. What you end up with is a car which is useless as a car. Nobody wants to use it because it's faster to walk. So when we have the decisions around autonomous vehicles, we are always trying to balance off that convenience versus the risk that somebody might die or somebody might be injured. It's a required trade-off that we need for the cars to be useful. The other thing which is interesting to examine here uh, is how many people currently die from cars, and it's a lot. I recommend that you never, ever go near a car. Um, they're a terrible thing. You should also never eat a hamburger. Um, about 40,000 people die every year in the United States from traffic fatalities, from traffic accidents. And you could imagine a future, 10,000 years in the future, where this has dropped not to zero, but almost zero. Because cars do have, autonomous cars, have amazing reaction times. They're covered in sensors, they're covered in things which are watching out uh, for, for a risk of accident. Uh, they'll be talking to other cars, they have amazing reaction times, they don't fall asleep at the wheel, they're not checking their phone, they're not sending someone an SMS, they're not futzing with the radio trying to get Bluetooth paired. Like, those are things which you don't have them uh, doing. But you could also see in that same future a uh, situation where you don't have many deaths from accidents, but you do have deaths from software defects. You could imagine a situation where 2,000 people die per year, that's only 5% of the previous total, due to software defects, due to some sort of situation where the software in the car failed for whatever reason it might be. And what scares me the most is that I think we'll see a lot of that, particularly in early years, due to software exploits where you have somebody who has found an exploit in an autonomous vehicle or an autonomous capable vehicle and is able to take control of that vehicle and use it for whatever purposes to assassinate someone, to kill someone, to just sow terror. And in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a quite famous hack of a number of Jeeps where you could take control of them over the cellular network. That, I think, will increase, and it's terrifying. The other thing which we'll see with this is um, uh, not just fewer people dying, but more people dying because of software defects, but we'll also see a concentration of liability. At the moment, you see 40,000 people die on the roads, and roughly 40,000 different people are responsible for those deaths. Here, you might see 2,000 people die in a year, but it might just be one company that is responsible for those deaths. That's an enormous concentration of liability. That may be enough that your company is absolutely ended by a single software defect. And what this means is that a lot of autonomous car manufacturers are very, very wary about entering the fully autonomous market. You have things like Tesla, for example, where they said, yeah, we're building fully autonomous vehicles, but you need to be ready to take the wheel at any time, just in case things go wrong, keeping the liability on the human. So how might you see something where this concentration of liability is addressed? Because I want autonomous cars. I want the future where only 2,000 people are dying rather than 40,000 people are dying. How do you address that? Well, one thing which you might see is some sort of legislati legislative change. Um, in Australia, we have a, a mandatory insurance uh, on every single motor vehicle, um, and that goes into a general pool. So if somebody is injured in a traffic accident, they have a level of insurance there that can cover them, which is provided by the state. You might see a similar sort of autonomous uh, vehicle tax, where if there is a software bug and the manufacturer was not being negligent, you have a pool of money that can sort of help repair that or help cover that. Uh, we might find that the existing insurance system is able to handle it. Because we expect autonomous vehicles to be so much safer than human-driven vehicles, maybe, pe maybe people will go, OK, I'll take these insurance premiums, and the insurance companies will realize that they're going to see a very spiky level of payouts, and they plan for that. But what I think we're most likely to see is widespread corporate ownership of autonomous vehicles. I think we'll see a few people uh, with luxury vehicles, which they'll hold, uh, luxury autonomous vehicles, but I think the vast majority will be corporately owned. And the reason for that is because there is so much profit to be made in corporate autonomous vehicles. So if you happen to be uh, driving a taxi, um, some of you might remember Johnny Cab uh, from Total Recall. Um, if you are driving a taxi, uh, the greatest cost of that is the human driver. If you're providing any sort of personal transport, the greatest cost is the human driver of that vehicle. 
And so an obvious way to make a lot more money is by removing the human driver. And we already see headlines like this. Uber CEO to Tesla, please sell us half a million autonomous electric cars in 2020. Now, Tesla ended up saying no to that, but we've already seen that Uber has their own autonomous cars program. And it makes perfect sense. If you can eliminate that human driver, not only can you make a lot more money, you can undercut everyone else on the market. And that is possibly going to secure you a monopoly position, which Uber would absolutely love. But this sort of technology is likely to put a lot of people out of work. If you no longer see humans involved in the personal transport industry, then in the United States, that's at least 230,000 taxi drivers and personal drivers who are out of a job. Now, that may seem like a lot of people, but it is an absolute drop in the ocean of what I think is going to come first. And that is the three and a half million truck drivers which exist in this country. Now, the reason I think this will happen first is because driving a truck for most of the hours of driving a truck is getting on a highway, matching speed with traffic, and taking the correct turnoffs. Those are things which machines are already very, very good at. The final part, the literal last mile of driving a truck, you can still have a human do. The, the parking, the getting to a loading bay, uh, the loading things on at a warehouse, you can have a human do that, but you can still cut out the vast majority of the driving time by having a robot do that long distance driving. So I think that we will see this first because machines are so accurately and so beautifully designed for it, and because they already exist. We already have autonomous trucks driving around Europe. This is a picture of them. And um, what you have is a convoy of usually five or six trucks. The first truck will have a human caretaker. The caretaker is not driving the trucks. They're not involved with navigating the vehicles at all. They are there in case something goes wrong. So you've already cut your human costs to a, a fifth or a sixth of what they were before. Um, so far, they have driven absolutely thousands of kilometers around Europe. This is uh, an old map now. They've done much more than that. And the interesting things about them is that they are more fuel efficient. Um, there are algorithms to make sure that they're braking optimally and accelerating optimally to save fuel. And they also, because they're driving in convoy, they will slipstream each other. So you use less fuel overall as well. They are also cheaper than humans on a per kilometer basis. And we're also pretty sure that they're safer than humans as well because they have such amazing reaction times. So it is absolutely conceivable that truck driving may no longer be a job that humans do. And to give you an idea of what sort of an impact that would have on the United States, we have a map here of the most common job in each state. And everywhere you've got this sort of cyan-colored uh, uh, texture where it says truck driver, the most common job is a truck driver. So we are likely going to make out of work the most common job in the majority of US states. And this is something which is not just going to affect truck drivers, it is going to affect people whose livelihood depends upon truck drivers. So if you run a motel, for example, that caters to truck drivers, you're probably out of business. If you run a truck stop, you are probably out of business. If you run a meth lab, you are expecting <laughs> your sales to drop and your distribution to drop as well. And we believe that there are about 8.7 million related jobs on top of the truck drivers themselves. So you're looking at maybe 13 million people who will be out of a job if we replace human truck drivers with machine truck drivers, which I am quite certain will happen. And there's a name for this. It's called technological unemployment. It's where technology replaces human jobs and people are unemployed because of that. And it's not something which is new. It's something which we've seen many, many times before. What is possibly the best known example of technological unemployment is the Industrial Revolution, where throughout Western Europe you had widespread replacement of, of human manual labor with machine labor. And this was a scary time. If you're a manual laborer, this was an incredibly scary time. And you would see situations like tailors that would literally storm factories with pitchforks and flaming torches and would destroy the machines or would burn the factory to the ground because they were convinced the machines would take their jobs. Now, this actually became so bad that in 1812, England introduced the Destruction of Stocking Frames Act. 
and it made it a capital offence. A capital offence. You could be killed by the state for this if you harmed a robot or, through an action, allowed a robot to come to harm. <laughs> that is how scary that was back then, if you were a manual labourer. Now, of course, as we know, we still have tailors. And, in fact, tailors are still... Uh, as tailors are more efficient and more effective than they were ever before, because you now have all these machines, like sewing machines, for example, to help them with their jobs. Um, but there are a lot of jobs out there which completely disappeared as part of the Industrial Revolution, and there are lots of jobs out there which have completely disappeared through technological advancement. And we don't talk about them anymore because, in general, we don't know that they even existed. Unless you've gone and studied the history of employment, you wouldn't even encounter these. So one of my favourite uh, jobs that used to exist is this. This is a water bearer. So water bearers would collect fresh water and they would deliver it to your house and then fill up the cisterns in your house. So you'd have a cistern um, in your kitchen, for example, and you'd fill it up with fresh water and you'd pay someone to do that. So it was like, kind of like Uber for water sort of thing. It was a delivery service for water. And, and these are fascinating because you can actually find startup guides for water bearers, talking about how do you find your customers and where do you source your water from and how do you do your branding and how can you do technological advancement in your field, do you get a cart and everything. Absolutely fascinating reading. But you don't see water bearers anymore. They don't exist because we have this. We have plumbing. Technological advancement has completely removed that job. Now, what we do have is plumbers. We don't have water bearers anymore, but we do have plumbers, but they're different skill sets. If you're a water bearer, that doesn't mean that you understand how plumbing works. And in fact, this sort of replacement of people with machines is exactly what I do for a job. The majority of my career, I have been replacing people with small amounts of code. Not so much in Shell anymore, but still, this is how I make most of my money. So what is something which we need? How do we deal with the situation of technological unemployment? Because I believe it's going to come in a very large way. So one thing which I think is absolutely essential is going to be affordable and accessible access to education. If you used to be a truck driver, you can't use those skills to be a truck roboticist. Even though that will be a job that exists, your skills are not transferable. If you were previously a water bearer, you can't use those skills to be a plumber. We need to make sure that people have a way of learning new skills, of being able to educate themselves, and that needs to be affordable and it needs to be accessible because this is going to be needed by people who are now recently out of work. The other thing is that when people talk about technological unemployment and the uh, Industrial Revolution, they often say, oh, like, people didn't lose jobs then. Like, jobs got sort of disappeared and new jobs got created, but overall, we're working about the same. And that is an enormous lie. If you look at how much we're working, we are working less. We are working way less. If you look at the typical work week in Western Europe, in 1830, it was around about 70 hours a week, absolutely grueling 70 hours a week. And in modern times in Western Europe, it's now stabilized at around about 40 hours a week, unless you work for a startup <laughs> or, you're, or you're an ops. But for most people, it's stabilized around 40 hours a week. We are working less, and it was a change that we were happy to have. It's a change where humans didn't have to spend as much time doing things for money. They had more leisure time. They had more time to do the things which they enjoy. And in fact, if you look at the change of leisure time over the same period, in around about 1880, a lifetime number of leisure hours would be around 44,000. These days, it's about three times that, around about 122,000. The reason for that is not just because we're working less, it's also because we're living longer and because modern medicine is amazing. We're spending less time being sick. If you're being sick, that's not counted in these hours. So this, as far as I'm concerned, is an end goal in itself. I want humans to have more leisure time, more leisure time because it makes them happy, and I want humans to be happy. But it's also interesting to see what humans do with their leisure time. So I've tried to study what humans do with their leisure time throughout all of history. And there is one thing I've found which is absolutely consistent, no matter how far back you go, and that's exchanging pictures of cats. 
it is, it is absolutely wonderful we have the internet now. We have exchanged more cat pictures than we ever have before. Um, but it doesn't matter how far back you go. You go to ancient Egypt, there were like pictures of cats or, or carvings of cats. And um, I'm a calligraphy enthusiast. I love looking at these old, like, these old manuscripts and everything. And you look in the margins and there'll be little detailed work and there'll be pictures of cats. <laughs> Not even flattering pictures of cats. But the other thing which you find, when people have more leisure time, and leisure time is defined as when they're not sick, they're not hungry, they're not in poverty, they're not worried about their circumstances. They can actually enjoy themselves. When you see more human leisure time, you also see an increase in innovation. Because humans have all these ideas of like, what if I could do this, or I always wanted to try that, and they'll research and they'll try new things, you see an increase in innovation. So you could imagine a future, 10,000 years in the future, where machines are doing most of the work, or machines are even doing all of the work. So this is a, a beautiful depiction of what that might look like, where you have um, a sort of a version one of what a Roomba looks like, a uh, quite larger machine there. Um, but we're sort of getting there. We've got the internet-connected coffee pot and everything. So you might have this future where machines are doing all the works. Although, I hope in that future we have better names for our machines. You probably can't see that, but the name of the robot is Made Without Tears. If your primary reason for wanting a robot servant is that they cry less than your human servant, you are probably a horrible person. <laughs> and you don't deserve that to begin with. But, but if you have this future where machines are able to do all of the work, where machines are possibly better than humans at doing all the work, they're definitely cheaper than humans, then you can end up with a situation where humans are not just unemployed, but humans are unemployable. Why would you ever pay a human to do a task if a machine can do it better or faster or cheaper or all of the above? And this worries me because right now we have this fundamental belief that humans are expected to have jobs. We have all of this societal uh, worth that is placed on someone of what do you do for a job? How do you sell your labor? That is the most common question that people ask me is like, what do you do? You know, that's how we define people, by their jobs. So I think it's essential that we start thinking now about how we can have some sort of a technological dividend where advances in technology improve things for everyone, not just the owners of that technology, not just the creators of that technology, not the people that own the trucking companies, but for everyone involved. And one way that you might possibly see this is something like a universal basic income which some of you have probably heard about. Uh, the idea of a universal basic income is that everybody receives a sum of money consistently just for being human, just for being alive. And this is something which is quite attractive as an alternative to unemployment benefits. Because the higher you see unemployment, the more unemployment you see, the more expensive it is to maintain a system of unemployment benefits because of the bureaucracy that is involved around that. So, when you have a world where humans are not just unemployed but unemployable, I think we will need something like this, whether it's some sort of a, a Star Trek-like future or something else where we have some sort of a basic guaranteed income. I don't think that should replace things uh, such as disability benefits or a medical system or all of those things. You need those as well, but this looks like it is a candidate for replacing unemployment benefits. Now, it's interesting because this is something which has been trialled. Uh, there is a two-year trial happening in Finland uh, right now, it's a small-scale trial, but it's happening. And we've already seen dozens of trials worldwide in various locations. And in all of those trials, we have seen a decrease in crime, an increase in wealth, sorry, an increase in health, and also, most importantly, an increase in innovation. You see people starting small businesses. You see people developing new technology because they feel safe taking the risk to do so. So talking about new technologies, um, I want to continue on to talk about drones. Um, drones have been a, a pretty big topic recently. Um, they're something which a lot of us are talking about, or at least in my field they are. And drones are wonderful. Drones have this enormous potential for good. Um, drones can take pictures, they can deliver parcels. Um, here's an example of a parcel delivery drone, and I know there's a lot of discussion now about how do we legislate this sort of thing so you can have drone-based deliveries. And one of the reasons I like drones so much is because they have such potential for good when it comes to disaster relief. 
If you have a situation where roads are closed, for example, uh, where you've had some sort of a natural disaster, drones are very good at looking for survivors. They are very good at dropping off water and medicine and those sorts of essential things which you need to deploy out there, which you may not have success with if the roads are down. So they have enormous potential for good. They also, of course, have enormous commercial application. Um, this is a, a, a cute example, taco copter. Um, the idea is that if you want a taco, you know, you have an app and you, you say, please deliver it, and it figures out your GPS location, and a copter comes and delivers you your food, provided you're in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, of course, that is actually a joke app. That does not actually really exist, but, but this does. This is the burrito bomber. <laughs> and it is an, a fully autonomous drone which delivers you a burrito um, with, you can't see it here, but there's actually a parachute attached to it. And um, the problem is that if you're in an urban area, like wind can blow it off course, so it's mostly useful if you want a burrito delivered to the middle of an open field, but it's real, it exists. So this is probably my favorite type of bomber. Um, this is probably not my favorite type of bomber. Um, this is a US Predator drone, and it's, again, a fully autonomous vehicle, uh, but it's used for warfare. Now, what is interesting with these Predator drones, and what I am thankful for with these Predator drones, is that even though they can fly themselves, they can do target acquisition themselves, uh, they can return to base themselves, they can do everything themselves, there is still one thing that is required for them to fire, and that is a human. Every time you have an, a military drone that wants to kill someone, it is mandatory that there be some level of human approval for that. A human has to be involved with that kill loop. Now, I think that's a very, very good thing, but there's been a military push to remove that aspect, and the reason for that is because it makes the drones vulnerable, and it makes them vulnerable to jamming. If you see a drone come over the horizon, and you know that you're likely to be attacked by that, if you are able to jam the signals going to that drone, you can stop it from firing on you because it can't receive that kill authorization. And in fact, uh, there was an incident a couple of years ago, the RQ-170 incident, where Iran managed to uh, uh, collect, uh, managed to capture a US military drone. It wasn't one of the predators, it was another drone. And um, technologically, the technology around that is interesting. Uh, we don't know if that was a GPF spoofing attack or something else, but they definitely managed to land the drone. And so this fear about jamming, this fear that jamming is an effective defense against drones, means that there is a push to have lethal autonomous robots. Advantages of these is that they can't be jammed. It doesn't matter if you try to jam them, if they have made their kill decision autonomously, they can fire. You can also have them with no radio emissions. They don't need to talk back to base. In fact, you don't need a dedicated command and control at all you can program them and you can launch them and they can carry out their mission. And you can completely disassemble your airfield and your command and control if you don't want the drone back and, and get out of there. These worry me, but they worry me in particular with a few combinations of technologies. So this is actually one of my favorite drones. Uh, this here is a Zephyr solar-powered drone. Uh, this is a picture back from 2010. And uh, in 2010, this solar-powered electric drone remained in the air for two weeks of continuous runtime. And it was landed not because it was having problems, but because there was nothing to prove by having it stay in the air any longer. So this is a drone that has effectively an unlimited runtime, provided you're not in, uh, at the poles in winter, you have effectively unlimited runtime. And that means it also has effectively unlimited range. You can launch it in one part of the world and it can fly to another part of the world. It might take weeks or months to do so, but you can do that. It also flies very high up. Uh, they're hard to spot. Their, their cruising altitude is about 21 kilometers um, above the Earth, so quite high up. And these are good for humanity. This is exactly what you want for something like environmental monitoring. If you park a, a, a flock of these over the middle of the oceans, you can do all sorts of environmental monitoring to see what is happening on the ocean surface from something which is much lower than satellites and gives you much better coverage than satellites. So these have enormous good for humanity. But you could imagine what happens if you have one of these solar-powered drones equipped with a weapon, any weapon, and equipped with lethal autonomous capabilities. And we have seen all sorts of scary dystopian sci-fis talking about that. 
Now, one of the biggest fears which I have is if you can launch a drone from anywhere in the world and it's able to travel to anywhere else in the world and make an autonomous kill decision, you have a risk of anonymous warfare, and this scares the hell out of me. Right now, you pretty much need to be a state actor if you want to use lethal drones. But I know that technology, if you have autonomous lethal drones, that technology will leak. It will get out somehow by, by espionage or inattention or something else or reverse engineering. That will leak. And if you can launch a drone and not have to maintain a command and control and maintain an airstrip and it can go anywhere in the world, you can have some terrifying results there. And it can be very, very hard to tell who is acting in a war. This is, in fact, such a big concern that the Human Rights Watch Project has advised, urgently advised, the United Nations that we need to be talking about this now. And there are a number of um, statements online uh, from top scientists and from ethicists and from computer engineers um, saying that we absolutely, need, absolutely must not have these and a large list of signatories for these. So this is something which I think is absolutely essential to be addressed. Um, but it, I can fully understand the military arguments for wanting them. But my fear is that once you see them, they will escalate. And that's a very, very scary future. So that topic of having intelligent machines um, and machines that can possibly be intelligent for warfare is a scary one. Um, but surely there's some really good things we can do with machine intelligence as well. So um, some of you might remember Watson. Uh, we have IBM here as a sponsor. Uh, Watson is an IBM machine and product. Um, quite famously, Watson won uh, Jeopardy in 2011, which is a big deal. Uh, Jeopardy is a hard uh, game for machines to win. It required it to have a whole lot of knowledge in sort of a natural language format and to understand questions and respond to them. And I've seen Watson used for all sorts of things now. I've seen Watson being used for driving autonomous cars, for making cookbooks, for uh, generating poetry, all sorts of interesting things. Um, but one thing which is being used for is to absorb human medical knowledge. And this is wonderful. If you happen to be a Sherlock fan and you happen to be a fan fiction writer, uh, which I am, both of those things, you can now talk about Dr. Watson. And you can have Sherlock AI crossover fan fiction. Um, but what's interesting, what's interesting with Dr. Watson is even if we're not there now, it looks like Watson is on track to get better than human doctors at diagnosing cancer. And in particular, at diagnosing breast cancer, because that's what it's specializing on right now. And this is a fantastic thing. You absolutely want to have machines that can spot cancer early. That's one of the best ways of spotting cancer is an early diagnosis. It gives you the best outcomes. Watson is also giving medical advice, again, uh, in treating cancer and particularly in treating breast cancer. And that is being followed about 90% of the time, uh, exactly as provided. So this should be a good thing. I absolutely want a world where when I see my human doctor, there's also a robot doctor that's sort of looking at my blood tests and seeing if there's anything which might be out of the ordinary and sort of highlighting issues early. That's a wonderful, wonderful future. The twist in all of this is that one of Watson's employers, if we're going to anthropomorphize Watson, is WellPoint. Um, they've changed their name now. Um, but when they started using Watson, they were called WellPoint, and they are the largest medical insurance group in the United States. And the reason this is relevant is back in 2010, before Watson appeared on the stage, they had already used software to target their cancer patients for rescission. Now, rescission is the process where you say, well, you know, you're supposed to give us your full medical history, uh, but we discovered that when you were three years old, uh, you broke your ankle and you didn't tell us, so now we're deeming that your insurance is invalid. Or somehow finding sort of loopholes to weasel out of covering someone with medical insurance. So you now have the situation where, and, and this was so bad, it actually received presidential attention. It received attention from the White House with a very clear directive to stop doing this. So you now have a situation where you have the largest medical insurance company that has a history of treating its cancer patients poorly that is using a technology which is at least on track to being able to spot uh, cancer before human patients, uh, human doctors, can spot cancer. And my question is, is that being used for the most good of humanity? Because you can understand how I could have reasonable doubt there, that maybe this is not being used for the most good. 
And that's something which I want us to think about when it comes to technologies. Now, everything which I've shown you here, even though I've said, let's think about it 10,000 years in the future, has been a real technology. Everything I've shown you here already exists. But I want you to think about them in terms of the future. If you are working on technology, if you're involved with technology, if you're able to influence technology, then is that going to be used for the greatest good? And if not, is there something you can change? Is it the te technology itself? Is it society? Is it something else that needs to change? Because I can guarantee you that the future will be awesome, but only if we engineer it to be so. Everybody, thank you very much.